Chapter Thirty Two of Pride and Prejudice. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Lee Paquette. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Chapter Thirty Two. Elizabeth was sitting by herself the next morning, and writing to Jane while Mrs. Collins and Maria were gone on business into the village, when she was startled by a ring at the door, the certain signal of a visitor. She thought it not unlikely to be Lady Catherine, and under that apprehension was putting away her half-finished letter that she might escape all impertinent questions, when the door opened, and to her very great surprise— Mr. Darcy, and Mr. Darcy only, entered the room. He seemed astonished, too, on finding her alone, and apologized for his intrusion by letting her know that he had understood all the ladies were to be within. They then sat down, and when her inquiries after Rosings were made, seemed in danger of sinking into total silence. It was absolutely necessary, therefore, to think of something, and in this emergence recollecting when she had seen him last in Hertfordshire, and feeling curious to know what he would say on the subject of their hasty departure, she observed, "'How very suddenly you all quitted Netherfield last November, Mr. Darcy! It must have been a most agreeable surprise to Mr. Bingley to see you all after him so soon, for, if I recollect right, he went but the day before. He and his sisters were well, I hope, when you left London. Perfectly so, I thank you. She found that she was to receive no other answer, and after a short pause added, I think I have understood that Mr. Bingley has not much idea of ever returning to Netherfield again. I have never heard him say so but it is probable that he may spend very little of his time there in the future. He has many friends, and is at a time of life when friends and engagements are continually increasing. If he means to be but little at Netherfield, it would be better for the neighbourhood that he should give up the place entirely, for then we might possibly get a settled family there. But perhaps Mr. Bingley did not take the house so much for the convenience of the neighbourhood as for his own, and we must expect him to keep it or quit it on the same principle. "'I should not be surprised,' said Darcy, "'if he were to give it up as soon as any eligible purchase offers.' Elizabeth made no answer. She was afraid of talking longer of his friend, and having nothing else to say— was now determined to leave the trouble of finding a subject to him. He took the hint, and soon began with, "'This seems a very comfortable house. Lady Catherine, I believe, did a great deal to it when Mr. Collins first came to Hunsford.' "'I believe she did, and I am sure she could not have bestowed her kindness on a more grateful object.' Mr. Collins appears to be very fortunate in his choice of a wife. Yes, indeed, his friends may well rejoice in his having met with one of the very few sensible women who could have accepted him, or have made him happy if they had. My friend has an excellent understanding, though I am not certain that I consider her marrying Mr. Collins as the wisest thing she ever did. She seems perfectly happy, however and in a prudential light it is certainly a very good match for her. It must be very agreeable for her to be settled within so easy a distance of her own family and friends. An easy distance, do you call it? It is nearly fifty miles. And what is fifty miles of good road? Little more than half a day's journey. Yes, I call it a very easy distance. I should never have considered the distance as one of the advantages of the match, cried Elizabeth. I should never have said Mrs. Collins was settled near her family. It is a proof of your own attachment to Hertfordshire, 
anything beyond the very neighborhood of Longbourn, I suppose, would appear far. As he spoke, there was a sort of smile which Elizabeth fancied she understood. He must be supposing her to be thinking of Jane and Netherfield, and she blushed as she answered. I do not mean to say that a woman may not be settled too near her family. The far and the near must be relative, and depend on many varying circumstances. Where there is fortune to make the expenses of travelling unimportant, distance becomes no evil. But that is not the case here. Mr. and Mrs. Collins have a comfortable income, but not such a one as will allow of frequent journeys and I am persuaded my friend would not call herself near her family under less than half the present distance. Mr. Darcy drew his chair a little towards her and said, You cannot have a right to such very strong local attachment. You cannot have been always at Longbourn. Elizabeth looked surprised. The gentleman experienced some change of feeling. He drew back his chair took a newspaper from the table, and, glancing over it, said in a colder voice, "'Are you pleased with Kent?' A short dialogue on the subject of the country ensued, on either side calm and concise, and soon put an end to by the entrance of Charlotte and her sister, just returned from her walk. The tete-a-tete -tete surprised them. Mr. Darcy related the mistake which had occasioned his intruding on Miss Bennet, and after sitting a few minutes longer without saying much to anybody, went away. "'What can be the meaning of this?' said Charlotte, as soon as he was gone. "'My dear Eliza, he must be in love with you, or he would never have called us in this familiar way.' But when Elizabeth told of his silence— it did not seem very likely, even to Charlotte's wishes, to be the case, and after various conjectures, they could at last only suppose his visit to proceed from the difficulty of finding anything to do, which was the more probable from the time of year. All field sports were over. Within doors there was Lady Catherine, books, and a billiard table, but gentlemen cannot always be within doors and in the nearness of the parsonage, or the pleasantness of the walk to it, or of the people who lived in it, the two cousins found a temptation from this period of walking thither almost every day. They called at various times of the morning, sometimes separately, sometimes together, and now and then accompanied by their aunt. It was plain to them all that Colonel Fitzwilliam came because he had pleasure in their society a persuasion which of course recommended him still more, and Elizabeth was reminded by her own satisfaction in being with him, as well as by his evident admiration of her, of her former favourite George Wickham, and though in comparing them she saw there was less captivating softness in Colonel Fitzwilliam's manners, she believed he might have the best informed mind." But why Mr. Darcy came so often to the parsonage, it was more difficult to understand. It could not be for society, as he frequently sat there ten minutes together without opening his lips, and when he did speak, it seemed the effect of necessity rather than of choice, a sacrifice to propriety, not a pleasure to himself. He seldom appeared really animated. Mrs. Collins knew not what to make of him. Colonel Fitzwilliam's occasionally laughing at his stupidity proved that he was generally different, which her own knowledge of him could not have told her, and as she would like to have believed this changed the effect of love, and the object of that love her friend Eliza, she set herself seriously to work to find it out. She watched him whenever they were at Rosings, and whenever he came to Hunsford, but without much success. He certainly looked at her friend a great deal, but the expression of that look was disputable. It was an earnest, steadfast gaze, but she often doubted whether there was much admiration in it, and sometimes it seemed nothing but absence of mind. 
she had once or twice suggested to elizabeth the possibility of his being partial to her but elizabeth always laughed at the idea and mrs collins did not think it right to press the subject from the danger of raising expectations which might only end in disappointment for in her opinion it admitted not of a doubt that all her friend's dislike would vanish if she could suppose him to be in her power in her kind schemes for elizabeth she sometimes planned her marrying colonel fitzwilliam he was beyond comparison the most pleasant man he certainly admired her and his situation in life was most eligible but to counterbalance these advantages mr darcy had considerable patronage in the church and his cousin could have none at all end of chapter thirty two recording by linda lee paquette